Happy Wednesday, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. If you have anything that we need to be praying about, we hope that you will get in touch, give a call, or send a message. For those of you joining us online, we will put the church email on the screen in just a moment, but if you're joining us on the phone tonight, the church number is 608-224-0274. We can get both calls and text on that number. And then please also remember that we are continuing to meet every Lord's Day at 9 a.m. We have shifted our seating a little bit to every other pew instead of every third pew. And so that allows us to add basically one pew on each side of the building in terms of capacity. And so we have raised our limit from 25 up to 30. So we can still be spread out. We did that this past Sunday and it worked really well. And so if you can join us this coming Sunday at 9 a.m., uh, please be sure to use the Sign Up Genius account if at all possible. If you need any help with that, get in touch either with me or with Kenna. But signing up has really helped us to come together safely. We know who's going to show up. We can kind of plan on that. Uh, right now would be a good time to sign up for this coming Sunday while you have your uh, phone or computer, whatever your device you're using is, is open and ready to go. This would be a good time to do that. I put the link in the bulletin every Saturday afternoon. And then the link is also in the bulletin itself on uh, the front page of the website as well in the announcements section. And speaking of announcements, we have a number of cards that have been shared over the past few weeks on the bulletin board at church. And so it's been almost overwhelming the number of cards that all of you have sent uh, thanking each other for various things and reaching out in that way. We need to have a better way of sharing those, but I just want to let you know that there are a number of notes of thanks and concern on the bulletin board right inside the front door at church. And I hope everybody is able to get there at some point to look at all of those. In terms of news in my life right now, I've been helping the Dane County clerk again over the past few days, getting ready for the coming election in April. And we've been doing the security verification and testing by firing up the thumb drives for every voting machine in Dane County, and then by running every possible ballot combination, over votes, under votes, all possible candidates, one way and the other, and just to make sure that those machines are up and running and accurate. And due to a, just a huge number of local races, we have had more than 250 ballot styles in Dane County for the April 6th election. A lot of school board stuff going on, a lot of city council races, village races here and there. And it is an interesting process. This is something that I've uh, been doing for many, many years as an election official for around 30 years, going back to uh, growing up in the Chicagoland area, starting that over spring break from college one year when my mom uh, needed me. She was an election judge down there. And I've continued that in Janesville and then also here in Madison and for the Dane County Clerk's Office over the past several years doing this kind of special verification process. And um, Election day always fell on Tuesday, which I had traditionally taken as my day off. That was kind of my weekend, Monday and or Tuesday. Um, but it's been an interesting distraction. It, it's work in a sense, but it's a different kind of work, if you know what that means. It's, it's not a vacation, but it is a distraction. I think a good way to get involved in the local community. As many of you know by personal experience now, when you have a home office, when you work from home, it is very hard to get away from that, isn't it? I don't know if all of you have experienced that, but if you're working from home, it is very easy just to get into it early in the morning, to work throughout the day, and then to continue on in some way or another late at night. And, and so it's very hard to make a distinction between what you do and everything else. But I, I just would say my work as an election official has been very helpful with that. It is a different kind of work and it's been a good way uh, to get involved. So that's what I've been doing the last couple of days. We ended early, uh, midday on Tuesday. They had scheduled Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but uh, we are so good. We got it done ahead of time. So I, I hope for the election to be a a good and a good process and as uneventful and low drama as possible. That's because a lot of work goes into that on the Dane County clerks uh, from his point of view and then also from the cities and villages as well. I want us to start tonight with some pictures that you have sent in over the past few weeks. On the left we have Kathy and Denise. I hope they don't hurt me. Uh, John, I believe, is the one who sent that in, so we'll blame that on John. And then on the right we have my parents. Uh, several weeks ago, I asked all of you to send in pictures of you and your family participating in the live stream, either on Sunday or Wednesday, and that we'd try to share these at the beginning of class each week, uh, mainly because we haven't seen each other for a while. 
uh, you've seen me on the computer or the phone or whatever, but I have not seen you, and a lot of us have not seen each other. And so we need to do whatever we can to stay connected. I hope you guys are calling each other, checking in online during the week with each other. Uh, but thanks to those of you who have helped with this so far. If you're willing to help by sending a picture of your own, of you or you and your family, uh, watching or listening to the live stream at home, if you're able to do that, I would really, really appreciate it. I know some of you are watching the live stream on the device that you would have used to take a picture of yourself. So that's hard. Uh, I may need to stop by your homes or something in a week or two here, get a picture of you in that way. But uh, if you're able to get a picture of you and your family watching the live stream, you can send those to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com, and I would really, really appreciate that. Uh, based on looking at some of these pictures, I, I think we need to uh, consider replacing the pews at church with recliners. We may need to kind of ease our way back into in-person worship in that way. Maybe, maybe not, but uh, thank you again for sharing those pictures. As I mentioned last week, we are heading toward the book of Acts. That's what we hope to study after we just finished the book of Luke. However, we are taking a break for one week and just giving a little space between Luke and Acts by looking at another worksheet. You may remember looking at several worksheets a few months ago, and we did this to become more familiar with some of these tools or resources that may help us teach the gospel to others. It's just another tool that we might be able to use, another resource, and it's also good review um, to be a little more familiar with the basics. How do we uh, obey the gospel and, and so on? So a few months ago, we looked at the Learn From Me worksheet. You may remember that's the one with the picture of the yoke on it and the yoke of oxen. And we compared that to yoking up with Jesus and, and combining with him and that. Uh, we looked at the checklist of what saves us. What do the scriptures teach? That worksheet. And uh, we learned that we are saved by all of those things. We can't just say we're saved by one or two, but we need to include everything that the Bible says. We're saved by grace. We're saved by faith. We're saved by truth. We're saved by baptism and so on. And then we spent a few weeks looking at a sheet listing all the references to baptism in the New Testament, basically a survey of baptism, and we put it in chart form where we could make some comparisons between those passages. Well, tonight I want us to look at another worksheet, really more of a study guide. It's one that we've probably used more than, than all of the others combined, and it is basically just a brief summary of God's plan of salvation, and I've titled this one, Steps into Christ. Steps into Christ. That's a reference to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. And to give just a bit of context there, I want to put the whole passage on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. That's where Paul says this. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad." And so the idea is we walk by faith, not by sight. That's the challenge of the Christian life. The Christian life is described as a walk. And I think most of us know when we walk, we make progress. Some of us walk a little faster than others. Some walk slower than others. But when we walk, we move. We go from one place to another. Slow, deliberate steps, sometimes hurried steps. But the point is we are making forward progress. And so we're using this to illustrate the steps we take to move from outside of Christ to inside of Christ. We want to be on the inside of the Lord and his church. And so it's the idea of taking steps. We're moving in a certain direction. Now, whenever we talk about steps in God's plan of salvation, we th I think we need to be very careful because we don't have a set or a list of bullet points in Scripture. In the Old Testament, they had the Ten Commandments, but even that wasn't everything, was it? That was simply a summary. We might say those are the big ten. Those are the ones uh, that can be summarized in an easy way like that. And in, in the New Covenant, we don't have the Ten Commandments like that. We don't have a set number of bullet points. In a sense, if we wanted to, we could say that there is one step in God's plan of salvation, couldn't we? We could say one step. We could say faith. Or we could say belief is that step. 
as long as we understand that our faith needs to be active and obedient. And so we could roll everything into one step if we could. We could split it up into two or three steps. We could divide it out into 10 steps or 100 steps or beyond, depending on how we want to look at that. We could summarize everything by saying, love God. One of the ancient church fathers, if I remember correctly, said something to the effect of, love God and then do as you please. Well, we might think that sounds kind of dangerous until we realize what he was saying there. When we love God, then what pleases us will also please the Lord because our wishes are so closely tied to what he wants for us to do. And so I hope you understand what I'm saying there. It's very hard to narrow down a list of steps into the Lord's body, but I think we can do that. And I think for study purposes, uh, there is a benefit to summarizing it through a series of steps. And so when we talk about steps into Christ, I just want us to understand going into this that we are not giving a comprehensive list. We're not explaining every single thing that we ever need to do in the Christian faith, but we're simply giving a summary. We have to start somewhere. And that's what this is tonight. And so tonight we have the worksheet. And on the worksheet or the study guide, however you want to describe that, we have six steps outlined there. I put this uh, a link to the PDF in the YouTube description, also in the Facebook notification. Hopefully I'm able to send out a link with the email that goes out on Wednesday. It might be helpful if you have this in front of you in some way or another as we study. Uh, I mailed it out to most of you in our phone audience this past Sunday. Not everybody. I don't have the mailing address for all of you. But those who don't have internet, those who get our a bulletin in the mail by hard copy by old-fashioned snail mail. I, I threw that worksheet in there when I mailed it out early on Sunday morning. So I don't know whether you have that yet or not. If not, I hopefully I hope that you will soon. But if you have internet access, go look in the description, download that, print that out, bring it up on a device if you're able to, and you'll be able to have that in front of you and be able to be familiar with this if you want to go through this uh, with somebody in your life as a way of teaching them the gospel. But our plan for class tonight is just to use this as a guide. And so we're, we're doing this review for our own benefit, but we're also we're looking at this with a goal of sharing it with others. This is a summary of what God requires, and we need to be very familiar with it. And as a summary, we need to realize that, that we're not just studying through the Bible and, and finding these things randomly. But we have arranged this on purpose, and we've been through this with dozens of people, really, before they're, uh, or when they're right at the point of being baptized. And I think some of this serves as a summary of what they've already studied on their own, or maybe somebody's worshipped with us for a few months, or maybe they've come to Bible class, or maybe they've studied with one of our members kind of sporadically. And a lot of times, I'll try to go through a sheet like this, often this sheet, and just try to summarize the steps into God's family and to see if they have any questions, just to make sure they understand before they obey the gospel. So thinking about it in those terms, let's go ahead and get into the worksheet. And obviously, one of the first steps in being saved is hearing. Hearing or understanding the gospel message. But this right here illustrates the challenge of putting everything in a list like this. Because in reality... Is this the first step in God's plan of salvation? It depends, doesn't it? Before you can be saved, you must be what? You must be lost. Before you can be found, you need to be lost. And so, in a sense, the, the first real step in being found is to be lost in the sight of God. And yet, when people want to know more about the Bible, we don't usually tell them to go get lost first, do we? Even though that's, in a sense, the first step, that just illustrates the uh, challenge of studying a sheet like this in a, in a set of steps. So uh, even though we must be lost before being found, uh, we don't want to encourage people to go get lost before the Lord finds them. But as we summarize the Lord's plan for walking in his direction, one of the first steps we take is hearing the Lord's plan for walking in his direction. We need to have a map, a road map, or a map for hiking a trail. We need to know where we are going in order to head in the right direction. So one of the first steps we take then is hearing and understanding the gospel message. Of course, on our end, we need to be telling it. For those of us who have already followed this plan, we understand these steps. 
And so we need to be explaining this to others. We need to be telling them uh, the right plan uh, in order to uh, how to be saved. People cannot hear the message if it's not spoken. And as God's people, we are the ones who are called upon to do the speaking of it. And that brings us to the first reference here. This is Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Really, we just looked at this a few weeks ago when we finished Luke. Uh, this is known as the Great Commission. After his resurrection, right before Jesus goes back into heaven, he gives his apostles a command. And one of the accounts of this is found in Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And the question on the worksheet is, what did Jesus command his disciples or his apostles to do? Obviously, he tells them to preach the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus and his kingdom. And part of this message is that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. We cannot obey this unless we hear it. We can't obey the gospel by accident. We need to know it. We need to hear it. We need to understand it. Something else I think we need to consider here is that we cannot be baptized right after having been taught wrong. And I hope that makes sense as well. There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of fake news, we might say, out in the religious world. A lot of people telling people they don't need to do certain steps in God's plan. And so we just need to be careful with all of the information out there. We need to hear and we need to understand the gospel message. And for those of us as God's people, it is incredibly important that we teach the gospel correctly. The other part of this comes in Romans 1.16 where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And the question here is, what is the power of God unto salvation? It's one of those two obvious questions, isn't it? But it reinforces what we learned in Mark 16. The gospel saves, but to save, we need to hear it and to uh, understand it. And before we can hear it, the gospel needs to be preached. So all of this is part of that process. So it's important then that we preach and teach the gospel, but it's also important that we hear the gospel. We need to listen. We need to pay attention to the word of God. This is one of the first steps. Assuming we have sinned, assuming we are lost, and assuming we are separated from God, one of the first steps to getting right with God the first step in the right direction, we might say, is to hear about God. We cannot obey and follow what we do not know. So hearing or understanding is the first step on this little page. And that leads us to the next step. Once we hear the gospel, we believe it. And the question here on this first part is, how do sinners obtain faith? We have to have faith or belief to be saved. So how do we get there? Obviously, it's tied to question one, isn't it? But the first reference is Romans 10, 17. And again, obviously tied to step one. In Romans 10, 17, Paul says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. If we're interested in developing faith, we go back to step one. Again and again and again, we hear the word of God. And I guess the point here is, if we doubt, if we have questions, we can choose to build our faith by listening to the word of Christ in Scripture. We read the word of God. Or today, we can very easily listen to the word of God. Uh, some of you have noticed that we are posting a video from Jason Haygood reading a chapter from the book of John every day. That's on the church's Facebook page. But every afternoon, Jason interrupts my day with the word of God. It's a great interruption. Uh, Jason is the guy I mentioned in a sermon about a week and a half ago from Janesville, grew up in Whitewater. I baptized him when he was a teenager, uh, ended up going to Freed Hardeman. He's now preaching out in Yorba Linda, California, but he's just reading through the book of John one chapter every weekday at the lunch hour out in California. Of course, the lunch hour in California is like 2 or 3 p.m. for us, but uh, mid-afternoon, Jason pops up and there he is, and he's reading a chapter from the book of God. Uh, from the book of John. And that's just a great opportunity. If we want faith, we need to pay attention to the word of Christ. John chapter 20, 30 through 31 is another passage encouraging belief. We looked at this one this past Sunday, in fact. It's where John tells us why he writes his book. He says, 
Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The question is, why were the things done by Jesus written in the Bible? That's not the best question I've ever written, I'll admit that. Uh, but what we're getting at here is, the Bible was written to encourage belief. This is why John writes. This is why we have the Bible at all. So that we have something to believe. So that we have the information we need. Uh, Jesus did some amazing things. And without the written word, we really wouldn't know about those things except by word of mouth. But the, the written word is, is the accurate way of knowing the things Jesus actually did. The other part of this really uh, leads into the rest of the study. What must faith do? That's the question there. What must faith do? And in a sense, this is a transition to the steps that come next. Notice James 2, 14 through 17. James 2, 14 through 17. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So faith has to lead us to action. Otherwise, it really isn't faith. If we truly believe, we do. And that's why I said earlier that if we wanted to, we could almost say that there is one step in God's plan. We believe if we understand belief the way James understands belief. I hope that makes sense. But if we truly believe the word of God, James says that that belief causes us to obey the word that we hear. So this leads us to step number three on our worksheet. When we look at everything the Bible says on this subject, Repentance comes in at this point. To repent is to have a change of mind, a change of heart, we might say. And this change of mind, this change of heart, results in a change in the way we live. It results in a change in the way that we behave. It, it changes what we do. We see what sin is. We see what sin, sin means to God and how, how tragic, how absolutely horrific it is, and we have a change of heart about it. We see what sin is, we see that we have sinned, and we do something. We change our behavior. We have this change of mind. And this is something I've really tried to emphasize more. The, the, the question is, what did Jesus tell people to do before making the decision to become disciples? And uh, notice what this passage says. Um, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. That's Luke 14, 27 through 30. Obviously, as people think about becoming his followers, Jesus is telling them to count the cost, count the cost beforehand. In other words, think long and hard about this. Think about the consequences. Try to anticipate what this really means in your life before you make this decision. Now, this is the opposite of what a salesperson might say, right? When we're thinking about buying a car. As we're right at that moment of signing the papers, they will almost never interrupt us at that point to warn us about how expensive it will be to repair. I've never had any salesperson do that to me. Wait, before you sign, I need to tell you that, that this car is going to be really expensive to repair. They don't do that, do they? But that seems to be what Jesus does here. Being a disciple is expensive. This requires a huge commitment. This is not for everybody. And so the question is, are you really, really sure about this? And Jesus uses the embarrassing example of a man who fails to count the cost. He starts building a tower 
but he runs out of money before he is done. How embarrassing that is. Everybody walks by and makes fun of the guy. Look, this guy started building and didn't have all the materials. He didn't count the cost. And of course, that's embarrassing, but it's even worse if we start following Jesus and then turn back a few years into it because it's harder than we thought it would be. Jesus says, count the cost before you make that decision. The next question is, what kind of impact did repentance have on the lives of the Christians in Corinth? And the reference is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Notice the impact repentance had on their lives. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. So how big was the life change that these people experienced in Corinth? It was huge, wasn't it? These are some huge life changes. Fornication refers to sexual sin of all kinds. We have the worship of idols, idolatry. Now, this is the way people were brought up in the first century world, especially in Corinth. They would be making a break with their families, even with their whole community at this point. The, the worship of idols was it's just how society operated. Some of these people were into that, Paul says. Um, adultery, basically being sexually unfaithful to a spouse. Um, note, it, it, they, weren't just, uh, they didn't just commit adultery, but they were adulterers. They were living in a lifestyle of adultery, uh, living in sin, perhaps, with a spouse who is not really their own. That's huge. And so they changed that. They got out of that lifestyle. It's a huge lifestyle change. Uh, remember, Jesus in Matthew 19 teaches that the one who divorces and remarries without cause commits adultery. Not just a one-time act, but this is an ongoing committing of adultery. This sin, like all others, can be forgiven. But like the people there in Corinth, a change of behavior has to happen. Such were some of you. You used to do this, but now you do not. It's not just saying sorry and continuing with the behavior, but it's a matter of getting out of that behavior. The effeminate and homosexuals are included here together. We may refer to this as being... Uh, either on the giving or receiving end of a homosexual relationship. I think you'll see that if you look into the Greek words that are used here. Uh, there were some people who had been in these relationships on both ends, who were now faithful to the Lord in Corinth. They had changed. They had turned away from that behavior. I would just note here briefly, they might have still struggled with that temptation. They may still be pulled in that direction. I would also emphasize a homosexual man might not need to go out and find himself a wife. That's not necessarily involved in repentance here. But the point is, he leaves the old life of sin behind to follow Jesus. And it may be a lifetime struggle from that point forward, but he has turned away from the sin that he was previously in the habit of committing. Again, not meaning he'll never be tempted or pulled or, or struggle with that but he heads in a different direction. He has a change of heart. Uh, thieves, obviously those who steal, the covetous, those who are always wanting more. If that word right there doesn't describe us in the United States as a society, I don't know what does. The covetous, those always wanting more, 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 and more. Um, drunkards, those who are always drinking. Wisconsin leads the, leads the list in terms of alcoholism in the United States. Dane County leads the list in Wisconsin. Madison leads the list in Dane County. And so of all the places we could be, the people around us will struggle with being drunkards. And that includes us in the congregation. It's a struggle uh, that a number of people have to be dealing with, just statistically speaking. Uh, revilers, those who are abusive with their speech, lashing out with their words, always challenging and and arguing perhaps in a hateful way. The internet has opened up all you know, whole new frontier for reviling and making people unnecessarily angry with the things that we say. 
uh, swindlers, those who are seizing or uh, constantly taking things from others, perhaps in a dishonest way. So here's the big list, right? The most amazing thing about all of these things Paul lists here is what he says next. Such were some of you, but you were washed and so on. They were doing these things, but they had a change of heart, and now they are not. This is the kind of impact that repentance had on their lives. It was huge. The next question is, what kind of impact will our repentance have on our relationships with friends? And this is something I've tried to emphasize before people obey the gospel these days, because the pull of the world is intense, especially for those who are new to the faith. Notice 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5. 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. As we consider repentance, as we count the cost, we need to be aware of how those who are closest to us might react. According to Peter, they are surprised. They are shocked. You aren't you anymore. Where's the old you? Where's the fun you? The fun you's gone. And they'll cut on you. They will do everything possible to drag you back into that old way of life. The point for us is be aware of that and stay strong. Know this going into it. Be ready for it because it will happen. As Peter says, they will have to answer to God for themselves. And that's really where we have to leave that. The next step is confessing, not confessing our sins, not confessing God has already forgiven our sins. As some denominational groups teach, you have to confess before you're baptized. That's not what's going on here, but confessing Jesus as the Son of God. Once we hear the good news, once we believe it, once we make that commitment, that decision to change, we are ready to commit to publicly state in words our belief in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, we are not Christians in secret, I guess would be a good point to make here. This is not something we do privately, but this is something we admit to others, to those around us. We put it in words. And the reference here is to the Ethiopian officer in Acts 8, 36 and 37. Philip joins him in the chariot, preaches Jesus to him. And this is what comes next. As they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I want to point out we have some brackets and a footnote here. Some translations might not have... Um, that and they may have the whole verse in a footnote. Uh, the confession isn't found in the oldest manuscripts of the Bible that we have. And so there's some discussion over where that, whether that verse should be here or not. But uh, something obviously happens here, doesn't it? Um, the officer wants to know, why can't I be baptized? Like, why not me? And obviously nothing, because he's baptized in verse 38. It would make no sense, though, to baptize somebody who didn't believe in Jesus as the Son of God. There are other places we could go for this. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Romans 10, 9 and 10, and so on. But at some point before being baptized, the Bible suggests that we need to publicly acknowledge that we do, in fact, believe in Jesus as the Son of God. And this leads us to what comes next, baptism. We have another awkwardly worded question here. How do we get into the death of Christ? Okay, it's not, again, not the best question I've ever written, but let's look at what Paul writes in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So baptism is how we get into the Lord's death. Baptism is how we access the Lord's death, we might say. He died for our sins. His death forgives our sins at the point of baptism. We are buried with him through baptism into his death. And then we're raised up to live the new Christian life. This is what it means to be born again. The old life ends and a new life begins. 
In terms of details, we have uh, the question here, into what three names or into what three divine names are we baptized? And we have the Lord's statement to his disciples shortly before he ascends back into heaven. Uh, this is Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're baptized by God's authority, with his permission, at his command. Stop in the name of the law kind of thought here. Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we've discussed before, this is not necessarily some formula that needs to be spoken magically over somebody as they are in the water ready to be baptized, but I think it does need to be clear to everybody involved that baptism is from God, and it is done with his authority and in his name, and that's what we're talking about here. The next question is, what is baptism? Sprinkling, pouring, or immersion? Well, we know the Greek word refers to immersion. We can look that up. And uh, But even without knowing Greek, we have answers based on context, where we don't have to know the original language. Uh, we've already read Romans 6, 4 a few minutes ago, where we learned that we are buried with him through baptism. So, I mean, we've already learned tonight baptism's a burial. It is an immersion without even looking at the Greek language. We also have Colossians 2, 12, where Paul refers to having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so baptism, once again, is described as a burial, that is, an immersion in water. Um, there are other passages that we could consider here, but since we're just doing the overview, let's move on to the last step here. And in a way, this is tied to counting the cost, but this is the ongoing commitment, the day-to-day -day Christian living obeying the gospel. And the question is, concerning Christians, what danger is addressed in 1 Peter 2, 20 through 22? So 1 Peter 2, 20 through 22, this is what Peter says. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandments handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. I refer to this as the dog vomit scripture. The danger Peter addresses is a Christian deciding to turn away from God. And the lesson is, don't do it. Don't turn back. It's a temptation sometimes. All of us struggle with doubt. We struggle with getting overwhelmed with things. We struggle. But whatever happens, we cannot turn back. Otherwise, we are like the dogs and the pigs in this picture. We'll end with one last question. What is the way we, what is the primary way we encourage one another in the church? And let's look at what the author of Hebrews says about this. This is Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. How do we encourage each other? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We encourage each other. We prevent falling away by getting together. Isn't that what the author teaches here? We assemble together. And this is why this past year has been so, so difficult for so many of us. We have missed the in-person encouragement. Hopefully more of us can meet in person sometime really, really soon because it is so important. And this is our worksheet for tonight. If you have any questions about this, we are in this together. And I would love to hear from you. If we can help in any way, if there's something we need to be praying about, please reach out, get in touch. Or remember to sign up for the 9 a.m. service this coming Sunday. I want to see you there, if, if at all possible. If you're able, if you feel safe doing that. I would love to see you this coming Lord's Day. And remember, next Wednesday, we plan on starting a brand new study of the book of Acts. 
You may want to come prepared by reading the book of Acts. Oh, the book of Acts, that's a that's huge, 28 chapters or whatever. Well, you can read the entire book of Acts in just under two and a half hours. For an average speed reader, not the average speed reader, the person reading at an average speed can read the book of Acts between two hours, 15 minutes, two and a half hours or so. Um, that's the length of a movie, isn't it? That's the length of a few episodes on Netflix. We <laughs> lay down at night, pull up whatever, Amazon Prime, Netflix, and we watch a couple shows. That's the book of Acts. We could read the book of Acts in that time. So I would encourage you to uh, just sit down or uh, stand up and just read the book of Acts at one time, sometime be between now and next Wednesday, if at all possible, or listen to it. I went on YouTube earlier today, just pulled up YouTube and said, like, reading the book of Acts. And lo and behold, hundreds of videos of people reading the book of Acts. And again, it took them, those videos are all between two and a quarter and two and a half hours. And so if you're not a good reader, want to listen to it, perhaps that is an option for you. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for loving us and for taking care of us. And we're thankful for your son and for your written word. We pray that we would always trust and obey. We pray that our hearts would be in the right place, and we pray for opportunities to tell others about the great love that you have for us. As we go back to school or work, as we interact with our families and friends in the community, we ask that we would speak and act with wisdom and love, with great patience. We pray that we would treat people not the way they've treated us, but as we ourselves would like to be treated. You have promised to judge us as we have judged others, and so we pray that we would be merciful and understanding with those we love. In a world that often seems so fast-paced and sometimes chaotic, thank you, Father, for being the one constant in our lives who never changes. We come to you tonight in prayer, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.